Well, good evening and welcome to this Lord's Day the Sunday evening service here in Chartridge in Buckinghamshire. It's good to meet together in the name of the Lord. It's good to meet together in his house and to bring our praise, our worship to him. And a special welcome as well to those of us, or those, sorry, who aren't here, but who will be picking up the, the, the reading of the word and, and the ministry later and listening to God's word. You're welcome wherever you are around the world. And we just want to praise and worship the Lord together. Our reading this evening is from Romans chapter 5. The letter of Paul to the Romans chapter 5. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, in what we could call his last will and testament, just before his final, in his final imprisonment and just before his final, his execution, he wrote to him saying that in the last days, perilous times will come. We certainly live in a world, it seems, a perilous time, a world when there's a lack of peace, that people's hearts are failing them. And many people, they don't know where to turn. A lot of the turning is to things that are temporary. Forget about the future. Live for today. Just a few weeks ago, we had what's been called swift mania. An American pop star called Taylor Swift. I don't know. I, I wouldn't recognize any of her songs. But she apparently is the big the big name, and people were flying around the world uh, spending ridiculous sums of money to go to her concerts. Tonight, of course, we've, it's football. We've had Wimbledon final, men's final this afternoon. It's, the, um, it, it's England, Spain in the finals of the Euros tonight. And again, many, it's what they worship. It's kind of, it takes away from the reality. We've had a change of government um, in the last week or so, a lot of uncertainty about where we're going, a lot of uncertainty about the state of the world. As many of you here know, I'm a chronic insomniac, and at uh, midnight, just before I went to sleep, I, I don't know why, I just picked up my iPad and just at uh, the BBC news page, and the headline was the latest um, airstrike in Gaza and 90 at least dead and hundreds injured and so on. Went off to sleep at five o'clock when I was awake again, did the same thing. And of course, the news of the assassination attempt, the um, bullet fired at, uh, at um, president-elect, well, <laughs> former president and hopes to be president-elect Trump anyway. Um, yet another assassination attempt of a president or somebody running for the pre presidency in the United States and the world are up in horror and many people are asking what is the answer what's the answer to be found those of you who are watching and picking this up on one of the 
platforms that go, that go out around the world. Welcome to you again, but wherever you are. Some of you are in a situations that are much more difficult than we know here in the West. Many of you will be in countries in situations where the gospel is, is virtually almost forbidden, where there's oppression, where there's persecution, or where there's great bigger problems with corrupt governments and so on. And you'll be wondering, what is happening? What is the world coming to? Is there hope? Can there be a source of peace? Is there a source of peace, real peace, solid peace, guaranteed peace? A few years ago now, in this country, in the UK, an art competition had the subject, the title, one word, peace. And the runner-up, we used to love going up to the Lake District, I'm sure many of you here do, uh, that area of northwest England where you have the you have the fells, people call them mountains, but the high hills really, and um, a conglomeration of lakes. And this painting had showed a lake on a, an idyllic summer's day. We haven't had too many of them this year yet, have we? The sun was shining, fluffy little cotton wool uh, clouds, and hardly a ripple. So the clouds were reflected in the stillness of the lake. Peace. That came number two, that came second. But the one that won the prize was a picture of the North Cornish coast with its rugged cliffs and the Atlantic breakers coming in, a huge storm, low scudding clouds, the waves crashing up against the, uh, against the rocks and two thirds of the way up that cliff, sheltered in a little cleft in the rock there was a seabird, a seagull. And it was just sitting there, oblivious almost. That's one. You see, it's easy to think of peace when the circumstances around us are all going well. When everything's going well in our families, in our lives, in our countries, our employment, our children, our income, our health, all the kind of things. And the political situation in our countries, stability and relative affluence. That's easy to think that that's peace. But real peace is peace that's not dependent on circumstances, not dependent on happenstance, what's happening around us, what's happening in the wider world or in our own circle, but that peace that's constant within the middle of a storm. Whatever happens to us, wherever we are, that peace that comes from God. Paul, writing to the Romans, was writing in the first century, when for, to be a Christian was anything but to have a peaceful existence. The, the opposition in the Greco-Roman Empire, the opposition from the, the pagans and the, um, and the opposition from the Jews, who saw Paul as an apostate, coming in both sides to be a Christian, to uphold the name of Christ, to go around preaching the gospel, as Paul did, of course, as God's sent apostle to the Gentiles, meant suffering, meant persecution. He was writing to these believers in Rome. The epistle to Ro the Romans is perhaps the nearest thing we have in the New Testament to a systematic theology. And Paul in his normal pattern takes 11 chapters to lay the foundation. That foundation basically of, faith, uh, of justification, of peace with God, being reconciled to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He starts off in chapter one, basically addressing the situation from those who didn't have the background that God's people in the Old Testament Israel had, that didn't know the true God, didn't have the scriptures, didn't have the prophets, didn't have the, the law uh, 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 and so on. The people who were ignorant, who we would say were the Gentiles, the Greeks, the, Pent Gent the, the Gentiles, the, the local pagans. And he says they're guilty because God has given them evidence, evidence in creation that he exists. And they've suppressed that truth. They've decided they don't want that. They want to have their own God. They want to worship wood, stone, 
the planets, the, the, the creation rather than the creature. And they worship men. They worship themselves. We've got that today very much in the world, and especially in the Western world. We call it celebrity worship. Television program, I've never watched it, but I believe it's called Pop Idol. It sums it up, doesn't it? We make idols. People make idols of people. They put them on a platform. They worship the creature rather than worship, worshipping the creator. And God says, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The good news. The good news of what? The gospel is the power of God. It's not our power. It doesn't depend on any man, any woman, any boy or girl. Our, our powers of influence and of oratory and persuasion and rationalizing and, and arguing for, it depends on God's power through what he says elsewhere is the foolishness of preaching. That's the method he gives, making God known. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. But then God's wrath revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What's ungodliness? I would suggest the first table or the first section of the, new, of the Ten Commandments. Ungodliness, not recognising God, not worshipping God, having our vertical relationship wrong. And unrighteousness, that's the horizontal level, how we relate to our fellow man. Both. But God's angry now. And Paul goes on to explain how God, because these things have been clearly perceived, those who reject the evidence God's given are without excuse. And three times he said he gave them over. And you see increasing perversity and right down to the end of the chapter when you get an awful summary. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, he gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. Disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they knew God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Doesn't that describe so much of our society today? Wherever we live. A world that's rejected God, rejected his, his word, rejected his law, given over to all kinds of evil. But then in chapter 2, he turns to the Jews, because there were Jews and Gentiles in Rome. And you can imagine that the Jews were sitting there saying, go on, Paul, as they got this epistle, suck it to them. <laughs> the, the, these pagans really let them know. And then Paul says, well, actually, you're without excuse. You've had the law, you've had the prophet, you've had, as it is, you, your, your, your condemnation's greater because you've rejected what you, the light you've been given. And halfway through chapter three, we have this awful summary. He says there that nobody seeks God. There's no fear of God before their eyes. And that by works of the law, by what we try and do ourselves, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. If it ended there, we'd have no peace. If it ended there, we'd have no hope. But there's one of the wonderful buts in scripture. I often say when I'm teaching God's word, when there's a but in scripture, underline it because it's a turning point. It's a contrast. But, and there are several great buts in scripture, and this is one of them. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There's no distinction for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. They're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. And then in the next chapter and a half, second half of chapter three, chapter four, Paul unfolds the great foundational doctrine of justification by faith. 
And then he says in chapter 5 here, and this to me is one of the most precious sections of scripture. In fact, the, the first few verses here, what does he say? He's got past, present and future. And in the middle, it's like a sandwich and you've got peace in the middle. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. What's justification? I remember from Sunday school days being taught justification means just as if I had never sinned. It's a legal term. It means God has had me in the dock and God's declared me not guilty. Not that I'm not guilty, that I wasn't guilty, but I'm not guilty because the price has been paid. An example, I think, explains this well. In Scotland, I understand, in the days when we actually used capital punishment for convicted murders, murderers, when a person, a, a, a murderer, had been convicted and was being hung, in the morning, on the prison wall or the prison gate, a big sign was put up. At 7.30 on whatever date, Hamish MacDonald or whatever his name was, was justified. What did that mean? It meant he'd paid the due penalty for his sin. He'd taken a life and therefore his life had been taken. Therefore now his guilt was cancelled out. We deserve to die. We deserve God's condemnation. But what's the good news of the gospel? That God has executed that sentence, but not on us, but on a substitute, on the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, his sinless one, the only one who could pay the price. That's what he came into the world to do. And when he died on Calvary's cross, he, well, by his life and his death, by his life, that was his active obedience. He fully fulfilled the law that we couldn't and his passive obedience and when he all our sins the sins of those who trust in him were laid on him and God's wrath oh yes God has wrath God is angry we saw that there in Romans 1 God's wrath is his holy reaction to sin and evil and he must punish sin his justice desert, demands that sin is punished in a court of law, if we have a judge who turns around to a convicted criminal and he says, well, I know you're guilty and I know you deserve such and such punishment, but I'm feeling good today. I've had a good week. It's my birthday. Family are doing well. I've won the lottery. Everything's good with the world and I'm about to go off on holiday. I feel a bit sorry for you. I think I'll be kind and I'll just set you free. There'd be outrage. Everyone would say, Justice has not been done. He should be punished. Yet so many people in the world seem to think that why would it's not right for God to punish us for rebelling against him and rejecting him. No, God must be just. Sin must be punished. It's either punished in us. That's eternity condemned to hell. Away from his presence. We decide we don't want God. We decide like those who cried with the Lord Jesus, away with him, crucify him. We will not have this man to rule, to reign over us. God says, that's what you want. I'll give you what you want. You don't want my presence. You don't want my holiness. You don't want my commandments. I'll give you what you want. If that were where we stopped, though, there'd be no joy, no hope, no peace. But what does Paul say? We've been justified. God has said you are not guilty because he accepted the penalties being paid on our behalf. The Lord Jesus Christ on the cross was the substitute of all those who recognise, accept that and trust him by faith. Justified by faith. And notice it's past tense. Since we have been justified by faith. In the Greek, that's aorist. It's gone. It's done. It's complete. It's a once for all. You can't be justified and then you need to be justified again. There's no going back. God says you're not guilty. He wouldn't be just having had the penalty 
paid in our place by his son. To then turn around and say, I want the same penalty enacted, paid again. No, God has accepted that. He says, you're not guilty. Positionally, he sees us as he sees his son. But Paul says, that's, that's done. In fact, three tenses of salvation. Scripture talks about we have been saved. That's justification. That's a legal position. We are being saved. That's the position from when we're converted, when we're born again of God's spirit, to the time we either die or if the Lord returns soon, first, we go to glory. And that's the first one's being saved from the penalty of sin. We're being saved, our sanctification, from the practice and power of sin. And going forward, salvation in the future, we shall be saved, glorified from the presence of sin. And you've got all three here. Paul says we've been justified, that's past. Now present, we have peace with God. Now this isn't peace that means we always feel at peace. We live in a fallen world. We still have this battle. In Romans 7, Paul goes on to line, uh, outline this. I'm so glad the Bible is, tells us what it tells it warts and all. The Apostle Paul says the battle he had, I want to live for Christ. He says, in my spirit, I want to do what's right. I want to please God, but I find another law. We have this battle. It's called the old man, the old nature. And sometimes we don't feel at peace all the time. This is not an emotional response. That would be the situation of that lake on the glorious summer day. The peace is that peace that's deeper than that. That peace that Jesus said he gives you. That peace that isn't of this world. That peace that passes understanding. That deep, that deep undergirds because we're at peace with God. That's the greatest thing. And to know that peace, Paul says, we have it. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. You see, grace is amazing. As Newton said, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He didn't have anybody to tell him that he'd been wicked. And when God turned him around, he could not get over just how great grace was. I think grace is a term like so many that's been devalued and misunderstood. Grace is everything that God gives us that we don't deserve. You see, people say, I think I'm good enough. We remember when we were ministering in Tenerife a few years ago, we used to spend time there before and after Christmas. And um, a little Scotsman called Willie and he came up to me at the end of the songs of evangelistic same songs of praise that we used to do on a Tuesday, right down on the front. Um, and uh, people came and chose their hymns. And he'd come along week by week. And the last time we saw him, the last time, it was the week before we were due to come back. And um, he came up to me at the piano, because I, I, I would do a 10 minutes epilogue towards the end of that. And he came up to me the, at, to, at the piano. And he said, Harry, he said, I'm not sure I agree with you. He said, I'm sure when I die and when I meet God, he said, I'm going to be able to argue my case. And he said, and when he realises I'm not that bad a guy after all, then he's going to accept me. And I tried to explain to him again. I said, Willie, no, you won't. You won't say a word because you will realise how sinful and wicked and how deserving you are of the sentence that you're going to get. No, says Paul. We saved by grace. People want justice. Never ask for justice. If God gave us justice, we'd be condemned to hell now. Immediately. What's the opposite of justice? Mercy. Justice is giving us what we deserve. Mercy is not giving you what you deserve. But then grace. Grace is not just cancelling out the debt. Not saying you don't have what you deserve. Grace is lavishing on you what you don't, you can't imagine. We're given all the riches of God in Christ Jesus. We're adopted as sons. We're co-heirs with the Lord Jesus. 
God lavishes, has lavished his love on us. God gives us what we don't deserve. And this is the point. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. God gives you it. That's his grace. That's what's so amazing about grace. That's what's unique about true Christianity. It's the only religion that recognises that it's all of God. It's God's initiative and it's God's doing. And therefore, all the glory has to go to God. And this is what Paul's picking up. Notice what he says. Through Christ, we've, object, we've obtained access by faith into this grace. The word access there is a good, strong one. I understand it's only used three times in the New Testament. A couple of times in Ephesians and here. Where Paul's making a access in Ephesians 2. It's access for a Jew and Gentile. The middle wall of partitions divided. We're all one in Christ Jesus by grace. This is the point he's making. He's making the point here. Lots of things have happened this week. And I was reading just a couple of days ago uh, of the what's reckoned to be the biggest wedding. Possibly the, one of the biggest weddings, certainly in modern time, in India. The, the, um, one of the world's richest men, the, the richest man in India, his son. Uh, I think it's his son that's got married. It's his son or his daughter, not sure which. But anyway, and celebrities and former prime ministers and big names have been flown in from all around the world. Celebration started apparently in March, but the actual wedding thing was this last week. And they say they reckon a minimum, minimum of £250 million has been spent on this. And that's just on the basics. And when you add in all the extras and the presents and the cost of getting in people, that's probably getting near half a billion pounds in Mumbai. And not far away outside, you've got some of the poorest people on the planet. And the comments in the media, just looking through the few I looked at, every one of them, people were saying, how can this be? How can the rich, the super rich billionaires have no compassion, waste, spend that much on an extended party and ignore the poverty and so on around them? One of those beggars could not get in to that wedding feast or to any of the celebrations. But what if one of the dignitaries took one of those beggars, those poor guys who live in the streets, and cleaned them up and brought them an expensive outfit and introduced them? They would be given and introduced them to, um, to, 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 to the billionaire father. They'd be granted access. I remember the story a few years ago of in Downing Street, a, 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 a chap from the north wanted to come down and do the, see the sights of London for the first time. And he wanted to go to Downing Street to see where the Prime Minister lived. And it was after the time when the gates were put at the end of Downing, Downing Street for security, of course, because of the terrorist threat. And he went there and he watched how people would go up to the gate and they'd peer and they'd take their photos, but they couldn't get anywhere near number 10 the Prime Minister's official residence at all. But then as they, he watched that, a youth just dressed in jeans and casual clothes, hands in his pockets, just sauntered up. And the armed police on the gate opened it up and kind of saluted him. And he just sauntered up casually up to the door and the door was open for him and he was welcomed in. His name was Ewan Blair. His father was the Prime Minister. He had access be to his father. None of us can. None of us could go up to Buckingham Palace or could go to the White House or wherever and just walk in and have access with the king or the president or whoever. But we have access to the king of kings. We have access to the God of the universe through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his grace. And Paul says, that's why we have peace. That's our standing. That, whatever the storms of life, whatever's befalling us, that's our standing through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We've obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Notice we stand. We don't grovel. It's, there's a sense of being established, a sense of this is position that cannot be altered, cannot be moved. Like that little bird there, the storm didn't affect it. It wasn't worried that it was going to get dashed against the rocks. It didn't worry that it was going to plunge and 
drown in the it drown in the sea or or whatever it had peace it could ride out the storm of life that's our position if you know the lord jesus as your lord and savior then that is your position now that's the access which you've had and he says we rejoice in hope you've had the past we've been declared not guilty we've been justified through faith we have access through grace to um to our standing our peace with god the new testament speaks of peace with god that's the first one we need to be at peace with god it talks about the peace of god that passes understanding the peace of god that garrisons our minds our hearts and minds in christ jesus and also you look at most of the epistles and they start off with either grace mercy and peace to whoever it is written to or grace and peace that's the peace from god but here paul's talking about the foundational peace you cannot have the peace of god in circumstances when the storm's raging around you unless you have peace with god first and paul and other um uh, other writers of the new testament epistles address their folk and they wish them god's grace a knowledge of god's grace greater awareness of god's grace in their lives and a greater awareness of god's peace to them so paul says that's what we uh, where we stand at the moment that's our present but then he goes on and we rejoice in hope of the glory of god hope that's not hope as we understand it today we're not having one but if we were going to have a barbecue tomorrow we could say i hope it's going to be fine remember in the past having house group barbecues one in particular um, i was in the garage facing up the drive towards the road and everybody else was in the house and occasionally somebody would come and uh, say to me how are you getting on why because it wasn't the fine evening it should have been yes it was warm it was humid but it was lashing down with rain we don't know we can hope in this life that something happens but we do not know we have no control i like to say this is the harry definition of hope hope is confident expectation and anticipation of future glory this is future why hope is if you like the culmination of faith this hope is sure there's an old hymn that says i uh, yeah i have a sure and certain hope that's what it is it's not just expectation i think we miss out when we just say we expect to be in heaven one day we expect to be with christ we expect to be free no more sin no more death no more tears no more pain no more sorrow no more disappointments that's all glorious true and we have that expectation but the hope of the new testament the hope of for for believers is not just expectation it's anticipation we can live and rejoice in that anticipation of that now that is the glorious hope and paul says therefore we rejoice it's a strong word it means we exult it means we 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 get excited about this it could be translated we boast about it it's it's what fills our life that's what it doesn't just keep us going through the storm it gives us vitality it's a living hope and paul says we rejoice in that it's future it's future but it's certain it's guaranteed going over just over it, it, uh, we'd love him to stop there wouldn't we if he finished there we would say great but verse 3 uh oh not only that he says but we rejoice in our sufferings ouch do we always do we always yes says paul because we know you see it's what we know this is why doctrine is important paul in romans as in his other epistles he lays out the doctrine first we have 11 chapters of solid rock doctrine then in chapter 12 to 16 you have the practical outworking in ephesians it's three chapters of foundational doctrine three chapters of practical outworking and paul saying it's what we know that's why the word of god is so important 
I hope you love the scriptures. Wherever you are in the world watching this and listening to this, I hope you value your Bible and you read it and you study it and you hide God's word in your heart. Yes, it's what we know. Paul says, we know that suffering produces endurance. Just three reasons why God puts us through trials. 1 Peter 1, that the genuineness of our faith is tested. How do you, how, how, how do you test, how do you purify gold, for example? You put it through the fire of affliction, the crucible of affliction, to burn off the dross. Amy Carmichael, the Irish missionary who spent a lot of time in, in, in um, India, working often amongst the orphans and, and girls, abandoned girls, we told the last 10 years of her life, I believe it was, if I remember correctly, she was virtually bed-bound. But it's worth reading a lot of her writings. But she tells the story how she went to a local silversmith once and she watched him and she saw him take his crucible and he would heat up the, 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 the silver. And every so often he'd take it off the heat and he'd ladle off the impurities that came to the top. And he'd heat it up and more. And he'd do the same thing. He'd heat it up more and he'd do it again. And she said, when do you know that that silver is pure? He says, when I can see my face reflected in it. That's what God's doing in our suffering. He wants us to reflect his son. He wants to see his son in us. And therefore, he puts us through suffering, through trials. Yes, we have trials to prove the genuineness of our faith. John 15, Jesus said his father prunes to cut off what's of us, the flower, the, 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 if you like, the growth. Every gardener knows if you want good fruit, if you want good roses or anything else, you've got to prune so that you produce fruit. It doesn't, being cut, being pruned isn't pleasant. Being put in the, um, the purification process in itself isn't pleasant. And finally, the third one, Hebrews 12. God wants our holiness, not our temporal happiness. And he chastens all his children. And in fact, the writer of the Hebrews said, if you're not chastened, if you don't know God's discipline in your life, then you're not a true son, you're not a true child. Yes, says Paul, we know that suffering is actually, it's not a bad thing, it's not a negative thing, because it's producing perseverance or endurance. And endurance produces character, turning us into the character of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame. Some other versions say doesn't disappoint us. Because God's love has been, he's just given you a little bit of love each. He's shared it out. That's not what Paul says. God's love has been, has been poured into our hearts. There's not a limit to it. God's love has been lavished upon us, John says. And it's through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You've got the whole trinity, I prefer the expression triunity of the Godhead, involved in our redemption, involved in everything. The Holy Spirit is working in us. It's the Holy Spirit who's, who, who's, who's been given to us. And God's love's poured into our hearts and continuously poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Yes, says Paul, we can know peace. We can know peace in perilous times. We can know that nothing can separate us from God's love. We love Romans 8. And in conclusion, Romans 8 starts with no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, those who have been united to Christ by faith. What did that mean? What does that mean? Paul talks about this of being baptised with Christ, baptised into his death. When he died on that cross, God sees me there. He died in my place. It was as if I died. When he was buried, I was buried. When he rose, was raised from the dead to new life, I was raised with new life. It's the old doctrine, we don't hear it often these days, of union with Christ. It's there in scripture all the time. In Christ, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Romans 8 ends with no separation. Why? What does Paul say? 
He gives a whole list of things, a whole list of things that humanly will take away our peace. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written? For your sake we're being killed all the day long. We're being regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, I'm absolutely convinced, he says. I'm absolutely sure. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth. And just in case he's missed something out, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Just it seems in the last few days, the last week or so, we've heard more and more we've heard of believers who have either gone to be with the Lord or one um, secretary of the church, I was in the leadership team for many years, who fainted, banged her head on the kitchen floor and um, was gone. Just like that. Other believers who knew they were going to die. and uh, But have gone to be with, glory, be with the Lord. It seems to be happening. It seems everywhere you go. We hear there's, the, there's trials. There's tribulation. We're in a world that's going. But these folk, they know the Lord. They love the Lord. And we know that they're, where they're going. No, there's no separation from whatever happens. No power. No thing. Life nor death or anything else, says Paul, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So whatever you're going through, whatever your situation, whatever your trial, don't look in. Don't look inward. The devil loves you to look at yourself and accuse you. Don't just look around at the world around you, but look up. Look up at the one who's at God's right hand. The one who intercedes for us. The one who died for us the one who loves us and we nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm.